In 1968, Paul Ehrlich gave voice to the widely held belief that the world was headed towards an irreversible famine with too many mouths to feed and not enough food. India provided a stark example. From 1870 to 1943, multiple famines in India claimed over 35 million lives. In 1944, a UN food and agriculture study found that over 100 million were underfed in India. The world simply could not produce enough food with the existing agricultural methods. No one imagined that the solution to this problem would come from the leadership of an American scientist working in the wheat fields of Mexico. Norman Borlaug was born in 1914 to a poor farming family from Cresco, Iowa, and lived through the height of the Great Depression. The pervasive hunger that Borlaug saw in his formative years left a lasting impression on him. He decided to pursue a PhD in plant pathology as he believed world hunger could be defeated through scientific innovation. Like India, Mexico was suffering from massive food shortages in the 1940s. In 1944, Dr. Borlaug joined a plant breeding program sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation to improve crop yields in Mexico. After intensive crossbreeding, he produced dwarf wheat varieties that were disease resistant, had multiple stocks, and responded well to fertilizers. Borlaug's leadership extended well beyond science. He convinced the Mexican government to subsidize the fertilizers needed for his wheat, despite strong opposition from entrenched agribusiness interests. He also led large-scale education programs for students and farmers in Mexico to spread his techniques and advice. Borlaug's scientific advances and leadership efforts paid off. Yields skyrocketed, and amazingly, over the next 14 years, Mexico shifted from importing 60% of its grains to a wheat exporter. The political and scientific skills Borlaug gained in Mexico would help him solve the much bigger problem that was unfolding in India in the 1960s. Population growth was outpacing food production in the Indian subcontinent, and catastrophic famine appeared imminent. In 1963, an Indian plant breeder, Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, sought Borlaug's help. Borlaug toured both India and Pakistan and advised them to try the high-yield Mexican seeds. The local governments were wary of foreign intervention and balked at changing traditional farming practices, utilizing low-yield local plant varieties. The Pakistani representative declared that the Mexican wheat required too much fertilizer and water. He also criticized the appearance of the wheat, claiming that Pakistanis adored their beautiful tall golden plants and would never eat Borlaug's red wheat. However, after intense negotiations, both countries half-heartedly started trials in 1964. The trials did not go as planned. Due to haphazard planting and low fertilizer use, the yields were unexceptional. The failure seemed to confirm India and Pakistan's suspicions about Borlaug's Mexican wheat. Through much personal campaigning, leadership, and political cunning, Borlaug convinced both countries to conduct a large-scale test using modern farming techniques, including mechanized tilling and robust use of fertilizers. In 1965, Borlaug returned to the Indian subcontinent to negotiate the shipment of wheat seeds for the test. The two governments ordered 450 tons of seed, but it was too late to make it to the Mexican ship. Never one to easily give up, Borlaug arranged for the trucks to move the seed from Mexico to Los Angeles. The trucks got held up by U.S. Customs officials. Then, the Watts riots prevented them from reaching the port in L.A. Borlaug was on the phone from India for two nights before the seeds made it to the ships. He woke the next day to discover that a war between India and Pakistan had broken out. Borlaug continued undaunted with his trials, despite very dangerous conditions on the ground. His tireless leadership bore fruit, and unlike the unfertilized trials, the large-scale tests produced a massive harvest. Borlaug did not stop with this victory, but continued to lead a political and public relations campaign to roll out these methods across the subcontinent. Much like in Mexico, Dr. Borlaug, Dr. Swaminathan, and the Minister of Agriculture, Mr. C. Subramaniam, cajoled and pressured the Indian government to provide subsidies and credit to farmers for new farm equipment and fertilizer. Just as things were starting to fall into place, Mr. C. Subramaniam lost his re-election bid. Ironically, he had been too busy solving India's food problems to campaign effectively. This political setback could have been catastrophic for the whole effort, but Borlaug would not give up. 
at a pivotal meeting on March 31st, 1967, Ashok Mehta, the newly elected Indian Deputy Prime Minister, told Borlaug that his plan to increase fertilizer output by 400% was impossible, as India could not afford the foreign exchange required. Borlaug refused to back down. Imagine your country free of famine, Borlaug shouted. It is within your grasp. The very next day, Ashok Mehta changed India's fertilizer policy to increase availability. The best hour of Dr. Borlaug's life, C. Subramaniam later reflected, was that hour he spent with Ashok Mehta. But Borlaug wasn't done. He continued his crusade across both nations, directly aimed at Indian and Pakistani farmers and government officials to adopt the new seeds and agricultural methods. Slowly but surely, his persistence paid off, cementing his legacy in the Indian subcontinent. Thousands of farmers changed their 5,000-year-old agricultural system and rallied behind Borlaug and his new methods. The 1967 harvest was larger than any in the history of Southeast Asia, despite a dry year. The Greed Revolution, a term coined by U.S. aid director William God, was now well underway. By 1968, normal rains had returned and Mexican wheat varieties had produced so much grain in India that some towns closed schools temporarily to house the harvest. Borlaug had accomplished the impossible. Millions were no longer hungry. Within five years, both countries were self-sufficient in food production. Since the late 60s, food production in both nations has increased faster than the rate of population growth in every decade. Borlaug was heralded as the man who saved a billion lives. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1971, the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1977, and the Congressional Gold Medal in 2006, joining a select group of seven great leaders that includes Dr. Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, and Nelson Mandela who hold this trifecta of honors. Borlaug's leadership did not end in India. He and his followers continued to fight hunger all over the world with enormous impact in China and Africa. He started programs sponsored by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization to train international agronomists at CIMIT, Mexico. Over the course of the last 50 years, CIMIT has trained agronomists from over 80 countries, solidifying Borlaug's legacy. His work and leadership also directly inspired research on other food crops, including maize and rice. Many of his colleagues, including Dr. Swaminathan, have continued to push the boundaries of crop yields. Borlaug kept working until his death at age 95 in Dallas in 2009. Despite Borlaug's great legacy, the Green Revolution has not been without its naysayers. Scientists have shown that the large-scale industrialization of agriculture can lead to negative environmental effects, including soil nutrient depletion, loss of biodiversity due to fertilizer runoff, and increased emission of greenhouse gases. Many claim that a return to organic farming methods is the only solution to these environmental issues. However, it is unlikely that purely organic methods will be able to feed the planet. This can be seen in parts of Africa, even today, where the governments have been slow to adopt modern scientific methods of agriculture. We are 6.6 6 billion people now. We can only feed 4 billion. I don't see 2 billion volunteers to disappear. As Borlaug's friend and colleague, M.S. Swaminathan said, Borlaug believed that science is our best weapon against hunger and disease. And the eternal vigilance is the price of stable agriculture. You have new pests, new diseases. As Borlaug always used to say, there's no time to relax. There's no time to relax. You have to continuously work hard, hard, more hard. Look at the problems which are emerging. Anticipate the problems. Have uh, ready solutions before the problem becomes serious, uh, how to checkmate, scientifically checkmate, uh, new pests and diseases. These are all important issues. And uh, Borlaug and I share common ideas in these matters. Agronomists trained by Borlaug are continuing his legacy by working on new methods to overcome these secondary problems while continuing to feed the world. For his achievements and legacy, Norman Borlaug will forever be remembered as the man who saved a billion lives.